Up next on today's Wild West, saddle up for 1876 at U.S. Cavalry School, riding the trail of Custer, Crazy Horse, and Sitting Bull on the Little Bighorn Battlefield. You'll ride like a trooper, fire the weapons, reenact the last stand, that sunset. and much more next on today's Wild West. The Wild West. It's still out there. And we'll show you how to find it. This is today's Wild West. The U.S. Cavalry rides again, charging through the Little Bighorn River on the very battleground where General George Armstrong Custer made his last stand. And the Sioux and Cheyenne had their greatest victory. Tourists from all over America and beyond pack the grandstand here on Southeast Montana's Pro Indian Reservation to watch the annual reenactment of Custer's Last Stand. Held just a short horse ride from the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument, where Custer fell on Last Stand Hill. The reenactment is a rare chance to see this epic chapter in American history come to life. You can imagine what it really might have been like. It actually is realistic. It goes along with the story, and it's super cool to see it in real life. It sure beats a black and white photo on the wall in a museum. For the men and women portraying the 7th Cavalry, this reenactment is the culmination of U.S. Cavalry School, an amazing eight-day immersion into the life of a horseback soldier of the 1870s. No, I'm having a great time. I mean, this is the hardest thing I've literally ever done. Uh, but you're loving it. You're I'm enjoying it. I'm loving it. Yeah. I'm loving it. Oh, oh, oh. And it all starts with the horse. Uh, just meeting here for the first time. Cavalry School provides horses for those who don't have their own, mounts selected to match the riding ability of the student, many of whom are relative newcomers to the saddle. I didn't do a lot of riding before this, but I've been taking lessons in preparation. We brought seven total okay. from all the way from Tennessee. There are also a good number of expert riders who bring their own horses. This is my first time here, and I may not ever leave. To ride country unlike anything they've ever seen. Well, Tennessee's beautiful, but this is really something special out here. My dad was in the cavalry. Kathy McGann is here from Washington State with her horse, Honey Moonshine. Now he's a cavalry horse. Now he's a cavalry horse. I think he likes it. The horses probably do like the saddles we'll ride this week. This was designed for the horse's comfort, not you. The same McClellan saddles troopers rode back in the day. Much lighter than a typical Western saddle, the McClellan was designed for the comfort of the horse, not the rider. And the Army was very clear about which of the two was more valuable. More than you are, remember that. Fact is, many people do enjoy riding a McClellan. It's comfortable, but it's not as comfortable as a modern saddle but you don't want down here because you'll lock your horse's shoulders up. But first, you have to learn how to properly strap it to the horse. Yeah, I always like to have you just right about right there. So if they do bend down. Bit of a learning curve, but with a one-on-one -on -one instructor to student oh, ratio. Helps. We are going to redo your pad though. You troopers get up to speed in a hurry. First time I rode one was 1976, first, art, first calf horse platoon. It's been wonderful. Yeah. It's been very informative, good repetition, good training. We're in the cavalry, and we'll spend much of our time horseback. And while you don't need to be an expert rider, it does help to come prepared. New riders do come out to our school. We encourage them that they, they need to have about four to six rides in before they go. One, two, three, go. But even those who do that may still need some pointers once they arrive. And calf school is set up to make sure that everyone is well taken care of. It's so helpful. Put your foot out of the stirrup. There you go. Now, I actually learned more in two days here than in six months of American saddlebred training, which was the only thing in the neighborhood. It's really been great being here. Grace Thompson is Cav School's chief riding instructor. I don't ever want somebody to feel like they're not capable of handling or managing their horses. I'm just here to try to help them be successful in doing that. Her own horse is a student as well. Mac is a Mustang. She's training for the National Mustang Makeover Competition. I've had him just right at five weeks. We shot off of him for the first time yesterday, and he was great. Now, this is his first time in a McClellan saddle, so we're going to see how he does today with our, our drills and stuff. Every effort is made to keep horse and rider safe. 
but spend enough time horseback, and sometimes it does happen. But if there are any bumps or bruises, help is close at hand. Colonel Bronson White, Montana National Guard, emergency medicine physician. We've had a few people take spills, but so far we've got them back on their horse. Oh, is that right? Yep. Some people have come out. Oh, right? yeah, it's the nature of the business. Yeah. <laughs> Just small little lumps and bumps, they're all doing fine. Later in the week, even Grace took a tumble off her new Mustang. So stuff happens. Um, sometimes it's good for stuff to happen to the instructor because it keeps us keeps us humble and in a place where we can understand where other people are coming from. Once in the saddle, we immediately begin learning how to ride in formation. Ride in line! Military marching four, love! on the back of a horse. Four, one, two, three, four. One, At its two, most basic three. level, the cavalry operated in squads of four when troopers dismounted for combat. Best mile. As they did at the Little Bighorn, one soldier held the horses while the other three did the fighting. Yellow right! Half right! March! We drill and drill by twos, forming fours. A column half left is a 45 degree turn. A column left is a 90 degree turn. Turning and turning around. It takes practice for both the humans and the horses. Getting our uh, horses used to working together, that's probably the biggest part of the drill. But we can read the manual and fairly well figure out what to do, but the horses have got to get used to working together and find out what expected of them. Formation riding, an ancient military art, is a fun challenge as well, as is fording the Little Bighorn River, which is serious business. Time it up. We want to be tight. Calf school leaders scouted often to find the safest path across, avoiding big holes in the river bottom and other dangers. Do not look down at the water. That swirling water can give you vertigo and you fall off. And before that first crossing, we are warned. It's important to pay attention, do what you're told, and follow the path. This first trip across the river will be the first of many during our stay. And even if you've done it many times, it's more fun than a roller coaster. Never gets old. You can't get killed on a roller coaster if you do something really stupid. Here you can. So that makes it fun. <laughs> For eight days, we're in the cavalry and we've agreed to follow orders. Orders that keep us on our toes, keep us in formation, keep us safe. The bugle keeps us on time. You had to communicate over long distances. You had a lot of people you had to get a message to. And so music through the bugle was the most efficient way to do that. Mark Jacobson is the company bugler, a student of the history of this instrument that was a critical communications tool in the days before radio. Music has been part of the Army since there's been armies. Trumpets and bugles and horns and those types of things. The bugle was used for a multitude of messages, the wake-up call, reveille, and charge, just to name a few. And it took some talent to play it while riding a horse. You need a good horse with a smooth gait. When the horse is at a trot, it's a little hard on your dental work. Yet despite its importance, little has been written about the bugle's critical role in the Frontier Army, a subject that, like the Custer battle itself, Jacobson finds endlessly intriguing. I mean, even today, you can see how people react to it, how they become in tune with it, how the animals react to it. There's an experience that you just can't get from watching a movie or reading a book. And it's so sketchy as far as what the trumpeters actually said and wrote down that it makes it an interesting mystery to ferret out. A big part of Cav School's appeal is its authenticity. Seeing the flag go up at sunrise, very inspired. Cav School is not part of the U.S. military, but it is run by and attracts a lot of military veterans. It feels good. It's comradeship. When someone is in the military and they do some fairly intense stuff and then they get out, they miss the people they were with. Our camp, located where the Indian village stood the day Custer attacked, is run as a military garrison. And after spending the night in wall tents, troopers begin the day enjoying coffee, camaraderie, and a beautiful morning on the banks of the Little Bighorn, summer in Montana. The bugle sounds again, and we head off for Reveille, 
Sound off for roll call. William. There's a balance between keeping it real and keeping it fun, but Cav School manages to do both. Yeah, it's a beautiful day. Absolutely beautiful day to be here on the Little Bighorn. With a dash of humor thrown in from time to time. There's people going to work this morning. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's totally unrealistic about U.S. Cavalry School is the food. Smoked teriyaki glazed chicken. Here we be, and there you go. No one on campaign with the 7th Cavalry ever ate like this. <laughs> How's dinner? Good as always. Yeah? I haven't had a bad meal yet. With help from his cheerful assistants, Julie and Barbara. Everybody's got a story, everybody's got a smile, and it just adds to the day. Chef Tony Sean is in charge of the kitchen. They come in here expecting hardtack and beans. biscuits and beans, and then they're getting what I would have to say is restaurant quality food. Competition barbecue has long been Tony's passion. I can take what I learned there and just scale it up and move right into this. Frontier Finery on for reenactment day, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. Dinners include spaghetti, meatloaf, and steak, plus special requests. Cater to everybody as well as we can. Tony does all that in a tent, where everything you see has to be hauled in and set up. And there are challenges, like the weather, which did act up a time or two. This must be Montana. Lightning, hail, storm, wind, rain, tornadoes, all at the same time. But for Tony, it's all worth it. Seeing the satisfaction on people's faces, telling me that the, the food is way better than what they expected. I just like to eat that all week. We do get a look at what the real 7th Cavalry ate during one of our outdoor classroom sessions. And one of the staples was a thing called hardtack. Made of flour, salt, and water, it was hard as a rock and lasted just as long. No, no this came in a box just like this, and they would hand them out. They were left over from the Civil War. Hardtack was among the supplies the trooper carried on his McClellan saddle, along with a blanket, canteen, carbine, ammo, and a greatcoat. About 100 pounds of gear altogether, neatly organized to fit on the horse. All right, go ahead, go down, fall in, and water your horse. A group of adventurous Cav School students put those packing skills to use late one afternoon, riding out to an overnight campout on the other side of the Little Bighorn. It's beautiful, unspoiled Montana. The trail takes us through a big prairie dog town, and the little critters are chattering with excitement over their unexpected visitors. The overnight camp is on the banks of the picturesque Little Bighorn where for one night, these 21st century troopers will give up their relatively cushy wall tent, complete with cot, to sleep on the ground the underneath stars. the stars. That's right, just like the cavalry men did it back then. They'll even eat hardtack, along with a nice meal of chili cooked yeah, over an open fire. And later, yes, pull guard duty throughout the night, keep an eye on the horses. This is a little bit more true to how troopers would have lived in the, in the 1870s. Definitely not as hard, but it gives them a little taste. Just uh, they're going to eat a little salt pork. They're going to eat a little hard pack. They're going to sleep on the ground with their saddle blankets and, you know, live with their horses out here. Any complaints aside about the reasons why they were here, having gone through this myself, like it demands respect, you know? You can say what you will about politics or intentions, but uh, soldiers have it rough and they're really amazing people to do this day in and day out. The sun is just coming up as the troopers return to base camp the next morning after an experience they won't soon forget. It was fantastic. We had a great time. Yeah, we all took watch. So my watch was from uh, one to two, but uh, it went by really fast and yeah, it was, uh, it was a cool experience. Cavalry school is dominated by men, but obviously women are welcome. And the ladies I talked to relish the experience. By all means, do it. Oh my gosh, I've learned so much. And like I said, my horses learned so much. And it's just, it's not an experience you can get anywhere else. So I think I might be coming back. I think I might like this crowd. Yeah. There were no women soldiers, of course, in the real frontier military, which was a tough life and a far cry from the well-dressed cavalry that rides to the rescue in so many of those old Hollywood movies. 
In the real world, uniforms quickly wore out. You would reach down. And the cavalry was often referred to as the hobos of the plains. We know in this battle that uniform standards were not adhered to. Uh, one account said that besides the guidons and stuff like that, you probably wouldn't have been able to tell that it was a, a regiment of cavalry coming down. But that being said, does not mean that uniformity, discipline, that those were all tenets of the frontier army that were, I mean, not strictly, brutally enforced. This is a horse pistol. These were designed specifically for the cavalry. And as we study the weapons of the frontier army, you can reload this on the move at a gallop. It's a bit shocking to discover the typical trooper who fought here in 1876 had very little firearms training. And they didn't give me any gun training? Very little. The Army just didn't have a marksmanship program until the 1880s. That is not the case for us. All you got to do is just push down until you hear a firm lock. Once that is done, you're going to come back up to the ready position until you are commanded to fire. We get detailed classroom instruction on how to use the same single-action Colt pistols and Springfield carbines the 7th carried. Then we're off to a live-fire shooting range to try out those guns there we go. There we with go. eye and ear protection okay. under close supervision. All right, good to go. Okay. I thought it was fun. Yeah, I liked it. The Springfield's short barrel made it easy to handle on a horse. And it was a powerful rifle if you hit what you were aiming at. Your adrenaline's pumping and your hands are going to be shaking a little bit and you're scared. You're probably just pointing in a general direction and shooting and not really taking aim and shooting. The single shot weapon isn't very fast or accurate, even in the hands of an experienced shooter. Like Sergeant John Slotton, who gave us a live fire demo at the shooting range, firing six shots in 45 seconds. Did I ever hit it? No, nope. yeah. one went way left, one went way, way right. Like you're Still, it is fun to fire the modern reproductions of the old-time guns. This is the one and only time we'll fire live rounds. Later, Cavalry School will issue each of us Colts and Carbines and Blanks to use in the reenactment. But even Blank rounds can be dangerous and even deadly if the gun is pointed at somebody, which instructors make sure never happens. So never point your firearm at anything you do not intend to destroy. Keep the firearm un unloaded until you are ready to use it. Troopers aren't the only ones who need gun training. Our horses do, too. Loud noises and most anything can spook a horse. So we teach our four-legged friends that gunfire tastes good. And reinforce that message over and over and over. First walking our horses, then riding, then riding in formation. Uh, this is a method that was taught from the 7th Cavalry to the Border Patrol, and then the Border Patrol later taught its piece, and now we're teaching it back to the new 7th Cavalry here on the Little Big Park. Extend your arm out to the right, shoot perpendicular. Where we also learn how to safely fire blanks from the saddle. We'll put those lessons to work at the end of the week in the reenactment, but meantime, We've got some historic country to ride. It's a stormy summer day in Montana. We're 50 miles southeast of Last Stand Hill, where eight days before Custer fell, there was more desperate fighting at the Battle of the Rosebud. We've come here to ride this sacred ground and learn what happened and see where it happened, but not before a bit of a rain delay. We're done. We're getting lightning coming over the hill. We can't ride. The sky's finally clear, and we're on the trail. Captain Keith as our guide. The Cheyenne call this battle the battle where the girl saves her brother. The Cheyenne have women that choose to fight, are trained to fight, and they are fighting hard. The Rosebud and the Battle of the Little Bighorn are both part of the Great Sioux War of 1876. They stopped here about 8 o'clock in the morning. When the Sioux and their allies refuse to give up their way of life, they ride faster. They shoot better off horseback. They are the greatest cavalry.
Three army columns from the east, west, and south planned to converge in what is now southeast Montana and crush the Indian resistance. But General George Crook never got there. Swarms of natives are coming to attack. Dozens were killed and wounded on both sides. Pursue and Cheyenne, get up on this ridge. And if not for the Army's Crow and Shoshone allies fighting against the Sioux, their bitter enemies, Crook's defeat could have been much worse. I'd actually never heard of this particular, these particular battles in the Custer um, overview. So it's very enlightening for me. Crook halted his advance, and with no communication, Custer never knew any of this happened. Today, all is peaceful, beautiful, and an amazing place to ride. I think just being on top of the hill and being able to see the mountains in every direction, beautiful scenery. Pretty remarkable to be able to have the opportunity to see something like that and, and kind of follow the, the battle as it unfolded here. There's no denying this chapter in American history is controversial, as was Custer, even during the time he lived. And not everybody at Cav School is a fan of the general. To a certain extent, I feel like he kind of had it coming. For me, it's more exciting to be where the uh, First Nations people defended their homeland and uh, kind of showed the invaders what for, you know? It wasn't the villain that some people make him out to be. Gary Stewart sees it differently. People aren't being taught the correct history. They're being taught a lot of other things. He's portrayed Custer at Cavalry School for years. To me, it's a great honor to portray. He's not the villain. He's an American hero. Cavalry School is all about teaching the history and all sides of it. Everything off the buffalo we use, everything. The meat, bones, the sinew, the hide, the hair, the hooves. They've given us the story of the Indian bravery and also have told us about the U.S. government's approach to getting rid of the Indians and, and what we did to them. So it's been very balanced. His command wiped out with no survivors. No one knows for sure what exactly happened to Custer. And we're all here to learn, as are the hundreds of thousands of people who visit the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument every year. That's where Sitting Bull's camp starts, just past that building. Where we leave the horses behind to spend an afternoon. When he discovered the Indian village camped along the Little Bighorn, Custer split the 7th Cavalry in three, ordering Major Marcus Reno to attack from the south while sending Captain Frederick Benteen wide left to cut off any Indian escape. Custer swung the other way to attack from the right with more than 200 men who were never seen alive again. Reno was immediately overwhelmed, his force decimated, and its survivors running for their lives to the hilltop where we stand today. Luckily, French kept his company together. He had the yeah. least amount of casualties. He yelled at him, don't run from an Indian fight. Benteen, who had the mules carrying the extra ammo, found no Indians and later joined Reno and his men, many of them wounded, fighting to survive on that hilltop. You've got Custer, who's, oh, they're all going to die if you don't go help You don't know, that. don't know that. Meantime, Custer, long out of view, had sent a desperate message. Big village, come quick, pleading for more ammo. But despite the gunfire off in the distance, Benteen made no effort to come to Custer's aid. So your Benteen coming in this, they're still in a fight. They're still ending shooting at them. He's lost half his force. He's got all these wounded here. You can't just leave the wounded and go. Yeah. No, but no, he's you don't telling you, you need to come now sure. and bring ammunition. Before so this know, happened, though. So you know it's bad. But you know it's bad. It wasn't bad and when so he wrote that note. you have to make a choice between helping the living or helping the wounded. And we had a lot of fun. My, my tall friend <laughs> over here. Controversial to this day. You have a lot of energy. You have a lot of passion about this. And this is one of the best conversations we've had um, at school and, and, and actually comparing it to active duty conversations with leaders and, and arguing about it. This was a lot of fun. You guys did a really good job. While the monument is a must see for everyone, there really is nothing like riding the battlefield horseback on the same trails Custer rode, seeing what he saw from the back of a horse and understanding why he had no idea what was on the other side of the hill until it was too late. It is a rare privilege to ride the sacred ground and quite a thrill for passing tourists to see the 7th Cavalry come back to life. Gives you a feel for history. Haven't seen anything like it. It's pretty great. E Company and F Company go down and attack the village right where our campsite is. None of this would happen without the permission of the real birds, a prominent Crow Indian family that owns the land along the Little Bighorn 
and much of the huge battlefield that stretches for four miles, only part of which lies within the National Monument. To be able to come here and to ride, to give a man a good feeling on a horse is, is, is what I enjoy. The Railbird family has long hosted the reenactment and shared their historic land. It's yours. It belongs to the people. The freedom to ride here is just amazing. One evening after dinner, a bunch of us hopped on our horses, boarded the river, and enjoyed a sunset ride. Pretty nice out here, huh? Yes, it is. God's country for sure. Look at that sunset. Beautiful. Yeah. It's awesome. As is the reenactment. Oh, it was outstanding. Never gets old. Never gets old. Culmination of this eight day adventure. Anytime you can play cavalry and get to ride a horse, it's an amazing day. <laughs> they call this a once in a lifetime opportunity. But I've been to U.S. Cavalry School three times now, and like many of my comrades, I can't wait to go back. That's it for now. We're back next time with more cool stuff from today's Wild West. I'm Mark Bedour. We'll see you down the trail. For more information on the people and places featured in Today's Wild West, or to order show DVDs and books, visit todayswildwest.com. Funding for Today's Wild West provided by the Leggett Foundation, the Chuck Wagon Trail Riders Foundation, and Monty Carroll Montgomery.